because the, the other thing that we've not mentioned as well is racket feeling mm -hmm. and you know whether we're experiencing an authentic feeling or whether we, it's one that we're covering over another feeling and it gets very confusing even for us that are feeling the feelings <laughs> well it's a, it's, a, it's a ta term you've used there yeah which is a uh, racket feeling so you know a definition of a racket feeling if you want to put it that way uh, eric byrne called the substitute feeling so it's the idea that the person that's born into a culture say where anger is the major way that the parents operate, for example. Uh, but what, and the, therefore kids might get stroked for expressing their own anger, but they don't get any recognition for being sad, for example. Mm. Or, or, you know, born into a culture where sadness, but they don't get any strokes for being happy. Yeah. So a racket's a substitute feeling. <laughs> We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next episode of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook and myself, Jackie Jones. And we're on episode 91 now. We're speeding towards 100. I can't believe it. <gasps> and what should we do? How should we celebrate when we another got couple of months and we'll be at a hundred episodes? How are we going to celebrate that? I tell you, on the hundredth on the hundredth podcast, I'm going to bring some champagne in. Oh, and pop the cork, and, and we'll Live. pop the cork, and, <laughs> and we'll have a bottle. We'll have a glass of champagne. That yeah, sounds yeah. maybe we should do one together. Maybe we should both be in the same room at the same time and do I one don't that way. Cope with that, but uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, the thought, the thought process of that. So, we're zooming on, yes. So, what's what we're going to be looking at this episode is how do we deal with feelings in therapy? Oh my gosh, oh my, I'm saying oh my gosh because it, it's one of my favorite subjects. And it's such a big subject. It's such yeah. so wild, wild subject. But where should we? We could start anywhere with this. But let's start with uh, years and years and years and years and years ago. Uh, I would have called myself a historian in many ways because um, I, uh, you know, I, I went to the university to do history, though I ended up doing politics as another story. Many people over the years also called me a narrative therapist because I love stories. So yeah. perhaps. I, link those two so if we look at the psychotherapy terrain uh, in in ways and models of helping people change uh, we can put them into four particular classifications uh, one would be through cognition yeah so therapists who uh, believe that change um, is really uh, you know met by people changing their thinking yeah and then a bit later on, or around the same time in the 60s, um, came the ideas of behavioralism, that it's through behavior, um, helping people change their behaviors, uh, that change will happen and the rest will follow. I mean, when you put those two together a bit later on in the 80s, you had the formation of CBT, if you like, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy which is the vote today in 2020 in the nhs anyway um so through c cognition leads to behavioral change um and that will lead to cure um so we got cognition we've got behaviors uh we've got feelings so if you particularly if you look at um fitz fitz pearls we've talked a lot about feelings and how um if we deal with feelings we will uh, lead to thoughts and behavioral changes. Um, so that's very important. Um, and many of those different models that come from that, like EFT, for example, that put feelings at the beginning of the road to change. And then there's, of course, many of the physical therapies, whether it be Reiki or massage or body therapy that believe in physical or you know bodily body changes, for example. 
are very important. And then, of course, on top of that, you've got the whole sort of, which is the fifth way of looking at it, really, is the whole level of spiritual change and the many, many, many therapies that concentrate on spiritual change, um, uh, uh, the priority of change. So we've got many, many different models of therapy that would take, you know, different ways of looking at how we um, start and the therapeutic point. Okay, so that leads us to feelings. So, um, do you think to be a well-rounded person, we need to be kind of okay in each one of those areas? Well, I believe really very much in integrative psychotherapy. So, I think we need to visit all those different dimensions with the client. Yeah, me too. Yeah. So, and be aware when... of areas where we're maybe lacking. <laughs> oh, absolutely, because. People will come into therapy with missing emotions, or yeah. they may come into therapy feeling very confused and stop themselves thinking, or they might come into therapy where they don't actually um, action their behavioural changes, or yeah. they might come into therapy in a spiritual wilderness. I think it's uh, one of the things I learnt in my training quite early on that I'm I'm a, a thinker and a doer rather than a, a feeler type person, whether that's physiologically and noticing changes in my body or whether that's, you know, n expressing my feelings very well. There's, there's kind of a, a, a separation for me that I became aware of quite early on. Yeah, and possibly somebody who has thinking as their major contact point, if you like, if that's the way you're looking at the therapeutic process. Um, they may need to get, it may be the route to get to their feelings yeah. where, there's a, where there's an actual blockage. Yeah, yeah. If somebody comes in and says, you know, I'm okay with thinking and intellectualizing and uh, XXX. So to, you know, to reach the client, you would meet them on a thinking level. But where they might need to get to in terms of what's sabotaging them, actually changing, yeah. might well be feelings definitely yeah yeah and it's the same with people who might come with feelings as their major contact level so every they see the world through feelings rather than say thinking or behavioral change yeah you might have to meet them at the feeling level to integrate their thinking processes yeah so which might need... sound a bit confusing for people listening but it it kind of works well when you know how it the system is. It's like the four domains of the self. I know you've added spiritualist stuff into fifth. that yeah. as, as a fifth one, but knowing that we've got those different areas that make up us as a whole person, but some were kind of our defaults rather than the others. We've got the ability to access all of them, but we tend to not use them all all the time. Well, I think that's pretty clear. And where that goes back to is a person's childhood and their family of origin. So if yep. in the family of origin, uh, you know, things were mainly through thinking. Yeah. Parents didn't really utilise feelings. And in fact, um, it was the culture of the day. Yeah. Then the children will use thinking instead of feeling. Yeah. And in fact, they might get told off for having access feelings. Yeah. Because they, you know, they might actually be told, well, actually it's important to be stoic. Uh, big boys don't cry. Or, yeah. Or that whole public school phenomena we're talking about. Yeah. Or, so, or, you know, I have permission to feel certain feelings, but not other feelings. <laughs> Yeah, it's okay yeah. to be happy and and joyful, whereas yeah. you can't be sad or scared or unhappy or angry or any of those what's seen as negative feelings. Yeah, or you know, in a nether ballpark altogether, you might be born into a culture where everything, where the parents see the world through feelings, mm. but actually they ha have confused thinking, yeah. or they have blockages around thinking as the major medium for change. So it goes back to the 
home and uh, the culture in their home, I think, to to where a child operates. So I was thinking about uh, my own daughter, who I think uh, where this comes from, because obviously is to us, but probably sees probably their default her default position um, might see feelings as the major way that you look in the world. But of course, she found a partner who saw thinking yeah thinking is a person's strength so between them they're pretty good yeah and that's that's often the case we find somebody that fills in the bits that we don't necessarily have ourselves yeah mm. so 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 clients who come to therapy um or let's put it another way often the majority of people and i think it's often to do the culture as well we have a pretty closed in culture in the united kingdom come to therapy um and they have problems accessing feelings. It's a very common, you know, uh, scenario yeah. in the therapy process. Uh, and then we spend quite a lot of, you know, therapeutic skills and help them accessing the parts of themselves, which, which are either feelings, uh, which they need to get to to be able to integrate the thinking and feeling and behaviours together. Yeah. Which is quite a big step for some people to Huge. actually be, be, you know, and without being stereotypical, you know, men often find it difficult to express feelings, you know, um, naturally or authentically or whatever you want to say. It's, you no, know, I've just, I'm, I get quite addicted to a television program, a reality television program. Some of the people on the podcast or viewers might uh, <laughs> you know, identify with it or not. And it's called the circle. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You have these, say, fifteen or sixteen people eventually, in a in a sort of constructed hub, if you want. They all have different rooms, and they can only communicate through uh, social media, i.e., i.e., um, through text on the on the screen. Yeah. Uh, but you see, in the way they communicate. The people who communicate through thoughts and beliefs and shoulds and musts and oughts, yeah. and people who communicate through the expression of feelings. Yeah. And even though you might say stereotyping, and we could probably say stereotyping, but the the men have more difficulty to express feelings through the screen. Yes. Than, than the female gender. Yeah. And it's it's really interesting. But even the language that we use, whether it's thinking language or <clears throat> feeling language, you know, like you say, on a text, mm. it comes across whether they're thinky people or feely people or or whatever it is, even even through words on a, a text. That's right. So often, not only is our family responsible for scripting us, perhaps against expressing feelings, but also the culture in the UK is pretty closed for men to express, for example, feelings. Yeah. So a therapist in these situations, I believe, um, not only needs to look at how the past affects the present and go back to um, that cult, family culture we're talking about, but needs to give permission to the client that the world won't collapse if they express feelings. Yeah. And you know, at another level completely, some people need actually be to taught what a feeling is. Yeah. I was talking to somebody else in supervision the other day, and they said, "Oh, we have a big, uh, a big, huge placard with all the feelings and diagrams of, you know, a person angry, and a diagram of somebody who's sad, and a diagram of somebody who's happy, and we teach them educative therapy." For some people, about what the expression of feelings actually looks like. Yeah. Which sounds surprising, but is I can understand it. You know, if we're not exposed to to feelings, if we don't talk about them when we're growing up and, you know, use a word to associate this feeling that I've got is connected to this word and this is where it comes from type of thing. How, how are we supposed to know? That's perfectly right. And <clears throat> in this subject of feelings podcast, um, the other ballpark, as I said, which is, 
I think rarer, by the way, um, but I haven't researched it. And that's where the um, client can express feelings, but they get lost in the feelings. And they often see the world completely through feelings mm. and have problems thinking and feeling at the same time. Yeah, which I would imagine is is what can be quite overwhelming. It's what if people you're... call histronic. Yes, yeah, yeah. But if you're feeling your way in the world all the time, it can be overwhelming. Oh, if you if if those are your issues around what you have just said, and you have problems seeing the world from a thinking and feeling place at the same time, or at least having that dimension, uh, if you're caught in that whole whirlwind and volatile of emotions, it become can become so overwhelming so uh, chaotic yeah if the client lacks that emotional regulation um they have they often have severe challenges yeah <clears throat> somebody else somebody i was having a conversation with somebody a few weeks ago and it it, it kind of it's something that i've experienced myself and they were saying they find it very difficult to not be overly empathic with people and you know they feel the same thing that somebody else is feeling even though they're not experiencing it type of thing mm. that's another way of looking at feelings do you know what i mean people that are empaths and knowing where uh, our feelings stop and somebody else's starts type of thing what a challenge that is yeah for somebody who's a true empath, if you want to put it in that way. And I think it's rarer than the other way around. That, that is truly challenging because they're taking on all the emotions of the other person, uh, often very overwhelmed. Yeah. Uh, that, is, that, that, that is rarer and uh, it does happen. Yeah. So th there's lots of reasons why people would come into therapy and you know feelings being an issue let's say for them whether they they feel them too much or they don't feel them at all or they don't know whether they're theirs is it you know has it been passed down is this my feeling is it somebody else's feeling this is a minefield when you think about it it's a complete quagmire yeah yeah mm. how do we know what are our feelings <laughs> Perhaps that's Put you on the spot, Bob. Perhaps that, should be a name of a Perhaps that should be a name of a podcast. How do we? <laughs> I think it's a very. I think that's a huge question. How do we know? Uh, I mean, I don't think it's so easy to answer that. You know. Yeah. Okay. I think in the world of spontaneity, for example, in the world of present feelings, I think the more. Um, access we have to spontaneity, the more access we have to be in the here and now, we're more likely to operate from our own authentic feelings. Yeah. A lot of people, though, who don't live in the here and now, lack spontaneity, they actually, um, I think, borrow from different models. I was thinking of a phrase which is very popular at the moment, which is learned empathy. Yeah. And I think many people especially men here again i know i'm stereotyping but i think it's true um they learn how to be empathic so they surround themselves with or even marry our partners who are empathic and they learn to be empathic from that person for yeah. example yeah and they're not really empathic themselves yeah they learn the behavior of it and and what yeah. it looks like and and things yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I was thinking the world of Asperger's and autism, where there's a so-called lack of empathy and they don't know what feelings are really. Yeah. Another huge ball game, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And I suppose in that situation, they do learn the the nuances of it, you know, how you look when you're having a certain feeling and, you know, mimic the look of a feeling and things like that, yeah. 
So it, it, it's it's a, it's a huge challenge. I spent most of my life, I think, as a therapist, uh, developing ways and techniques to help people um, look at a different split off parts of themselves. And often, usually, one of the big splits is between thinking and feeling. Yeah. And um, it's usually because uh, they've been traumatized. And, th and what happens in trauma that is you split off the part that is so scary or so difficult to relive or visit. You cut off that part and you use another part of yourself. And it's, it's often the split between thinking and feeling. Yeah. And feelings yeah. can be quite scary and overwhelming. <clears throat> yeah, of course. You know, we, we don't scary. readily run into wanting to feel them because they can be quite overwhelming and scary. One of the tips for therapists, I think, I would give, listen to, you know, this podcast and how to do with feelings, whichever way we look at it, this, is to tread carefully. Mm. See, I think therapists might, let's take the scenario where they are searching for feelings, for example, maybe. Um, often the thinking, the co you know, the cognition I'm talking about or the behaviours are defences against the person expressing feelings for very good reasons. Mm. And I, I want to say, let's honour these defences and go with the defences and we'll eventually get to what the person's defending against, which might be the expression of feelings, scare or whatever it is, for very, very good reasons. Yeah. So tread carefully. Yeah. Because the, the other thing that we've not mentioned as well is racket feeling. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whether we're experiencing an authentic feeling or whether we, it's one that we're covering over another feeling. And it gets very confusing, even for us that are feeling the feelings. <laughs> well, it's a, it's, a, it's a TA term you've used there. Yeah. Which is a uh, racket feeling. So, you know, a definition of a racket feeling, if you want to put it that way, uh, Eric Byrne called a substitute feeling. So it's the idea that the person that's born into a culture, say, where anger is the major way that the parents operate, for example. Uh, but what, and the, therefore, kids might get stroked for expressing their own anger, but they don't get any recognition for being sad, for example. Mm. Oh, or, you know, born into a culture where sadness, but they don't get any strokes for being happy. Yeah. So a racket's a substitute feeling. <clears throat> the one thing I would say, though, and in, in, in inverted commas, we can call them all, I think, authentic feelings. And as we explore one feeling, if you tread lightly, you'll get to the other. Yeah. You'll get to what's underneath a feeling. Yeah. Another way to look at it is, is um, for therapists or stroke counsellors, is to look at what's missing. Which emotion is missing for the client? So the client that expresses a lot of um, sadness, but never expresses happiness, or never expresses anger, I would call a missing emotion. So as well yeah. as like helping you know, the therapist to search for the missing emotion. I've had quite a few clients that find it very difficult to express anger. Mm. Oh, yeah. That, yeah. And yeah. I, I kind of, for me, anger is a really good emotion for motivating me to make a change. I find anger quite useful if it's used appropriately. <laughs> but I, it's surprising how many clients I can think of that don't know how to express anger appropriately. It's because they haven't been stroked, they haven't been recognised for that. Yeah. That's the opposite. Yeah. Family of origin. They're told off. Yeah. Anger or being assertive or uh, in that ballpark, uh, they have to be polite or adapt or yeah to get the recognition. I'm I I'm quite good with anger. <laughs> yeah. So I I don't I haven't visited you, you your childhood, but. I bet if we traced it back, unless you've changed in therapy, we would find the reasons. Yeah, oh, definitely, yeah. 
the other thing I, I noticed when I was in therapy and going through my training that I'm really good at is I cover up fear or scare with anger. Uh, Rather than showing uh, fear, I will come out fighting. That That's something that I do quite a lot, even now, but I'm aware that I do it now. <laughs> so that would be called a racket feeling, TA, a substitute feeling. Yeah. You would defend in a certain way. Yeah. So feeling as a substitute for the hidden feeling yeah i come out with my fists up i come out fighting you know, I, I prefer <laughs> the, yeah i prefer than using the word or unauthentic i think they're all authentic feelings but some are hidden uh, more than others and some are defense feelings more than others yeah the tricky little blighters feelings when we think about it <laughs> you know to to understand what we're feeling why we're feeling it where it comes from or what we do with it it's it's quite yeah it's a bit of a minefield yeah it needs the therapist to help the client really yeah uh, to work um, through what other way what, whether it's where they're overcome by feelings whether they can't get in touch with their feelings um it's the therapist sort of process to be help and get through this yeah now the problem comes of course is when the therapists themselves are afraid of feelings or or they uh use cognition as a way of yeah you know, getting to feelings themselves so you end up intellectualizing but you never really go near the yeah the process itself so it's that, that used to be me. I'll hold my hand up to that. When I first started practicing, I was I was frightened of having a histrionic client or somebody that was a very feely person because I didn't think I could cope with that amount of feeling in a room. Yeah. Do you remember what you used to do then? I, I would avoid it. I would tippy toe around it. I could sense when somebody was starting to get emotional, and I would veer off and, and get them back into their thinking again because I found it more comfortable. Yeah, you'd probably intellectualise. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I would I would start doing educative things and I would be <laughs> doing more of that to keep them away from it. Whereas now I'm a lot more comfortable with it. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's very common what you've just said. Yeah. Um, I think I was always frightened of not being able to bring them back again. I, I, and that's probably because that's how I felt when I was feeling certain emotions that I would never come back from it. So I think I kind of took that into it. Yeah, and no, I suspect what happened is she went through your own therapy or in supervision dealt with the own what we would call counter transference. Then uh, you would have not only helped yourself in life, but been a much more complete therapist. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, and it's okay. I, I learned, you know, that I know we've spoke about it, but quiet, I don't like quiet either, or I didn't used to like it as much. But it's okay to be alongside somebody having, you know, quite big emotions and not have to do anything with them. Oh, yes, often just to be with them. That's it, yeah, to let them feel whatever it is that they're feeling and come out the other end without having to actually do anything for them, yeah. That in itself may often be emotional regulation because, uh, you know, it's a really big part, isn't it, emotional regulation, where the child hasn't had a parent that helps them regulate their emotions. Yeah, and yeah. The child does actually doesn't know how to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Which in a therapy room is really powerful to be there and to, whether it's modelling that to them or allowing them to, to work the wrong way through it or whatever that that's really powerful in a, a therapy situation yeah i'm glad you said someone's ringing me I, i'm glad you said modeling by the way because i think modeling is a really big part in terms of emotional regulation yeah so that the um the client actually can see in front of them how the therapist actually you know deals with emotions yeah because they often haven't had that type of education if you like around emotions yeah and holding that safe space for them to express their emotions is is again it's quite powerful that 
extraordinary part. They're not going to overwhelm us. <laughs> you know, we we can we can cope with whatever emotions they're having at that time. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was quite happy to say if we go back way back in history when I first went to therapy, uh, I certainly didn't know anything about emotions or how to express emotions, and there was part of my part of myself which uh, which I, which actually we got to eventually, which which had a process around well, if I really how can I explain this? If I really express my emotions, I'm going to lose it. Yeah, and I'll hurt someone else. Yeah. So I had to keep everything in because not only do control things for myself and not feel vulnerable, but also, you know, if I really let go, then I'm going to go crazy or going to, you know, hurt someone else. So there was a double pressure yeah. to not express feelings. So it's the belief systems that we often have. Well, if I get really angry around here, I'm going to go crazy or something like that. Yeah, yeah. But it also buys into the system. Yeah. It's it, it, feelings are a minefield, Bob. <laughs> they're a minefield because we're not, to, they're a minefield for lots of reasons. I we think. don't talk openly about them, do we? So, you know, I, I know what I feel, but I don't necessarily know what somebody else feels. And it's it's that void in between the two. You know, if I say I'm feeling scared, I know how I feel scared, but I don't necessarily know how the other person feels when they're feeling scared. Oh, oh. That's why therapy, and I think therapy groups as well, by the way, are so powerful here. Because yeah. you can, you know, invite people in the group to express, well, you know, what's the impact, you know, their thoughts and what's the impact and somebody shares feeling yeah and then the person hears what the impact of the other person is and usually it's the opposite of what they think yes yeah yeah so i think you know groups are very important or can be therapeutically here yeah i'm not saying you have to go into group to look at all this but i i do think groups can be very important in this inter interpersonal sharing if you like I think that's really valuable. Yes, it's good to have individual therapy, but you know, to be with a group, I think you do get it on a different level. Yeah, it's completely different. The the therapy isn't I don't think you can compare the two. Now we had a podcast about it all, didn't we? Yeah, um, yeah. Groups have been individual therapy, but in terms of what we're talking about here. Uh, sharing emotions or not sharing emotions at an interpersonal level, there's nothing which quite beats the person hearing the impact of their sharing or not sharing has on the other person. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. You're right, it is a mindful, but it's a... That's why I said, it seems ages ago now in this podcast, I said to the therapist... If I had to give one tip around working with feelings, whichever way it is, it would be to tread lightly. Yeah. Because it's a minefield. Yeah. Minds all over the place. Yeah. Will and can erupt. Yeah. And, you know, yes, tread lightly, but it's also, you know, about being really self-aware of your own... Transfers transference and what's going on for you and and all that sort of stuff yeah another uh, wonderful uh, podcast bob yeah and also just before we dash off what, what you were just going to just talk about that another whole podcast but i just want to mention it here about the therapist may choose at the right time to share their own feelings mm. but it may it must be in the service of the client yeah yeah, I've done. I've done that. I have. I have, you know, said in the session that what they've shared or what's happened has really moved me, or I feel a certain way when you shared that or whatever. Just to acknowledge mm -hmm. that I had made a connection to it or them in some way. Yeah. Good, wonderful subject. I feel very. If yeah, happy. Yeah, yeah, happy. I feel very happy that we've been talking about this because um i don't hear many podcasts around 
or discussions around where therapists talk about you know how we handle feelings mm. and i think you know in society as a whole and families as a whole and groups of people at a home i think if we if we can sort of give permissions or models to talk more about feelings uh, i think that's wonderful do you know, Bob, I think our podcast is amazing with the topics that we talk about because... We talk about a lot of different topics. Well, on different levels as well. You know, you're the font of all knowledge and my guru and mentor oh. and everything, and you've got all that side of, of it. But then I think we share our own experiences as people and therapists as well. Yeah. I think we both of us share our wisdom as well. Yeah. Because both of us have years of experience that we can pass on. And I think we also um, pass on, not well, we pass on our wisdom, our skills, our techniques, but hopefully um, we can actually pass on, how can I explain it? The therapy, uh, the therapeutic process is not something to be afraid of. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I can, you know, even just in this podcast, talking earlier on about being frightened of people showing their feelings when I first started. When I look at where I am now to 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 then, mm. we do, we get there in the end. It's a really scary thing to be a therapist when you mm. first walk in that room with your first client. Mm. Yeah. It's a good thing to remember, therapists, that, you know, <laughs> that they're used that the clients are as scared as you are usually yeah. um, and uh i can remember you saying that to me when we first started you know what i mean it was like yeah uh, and it's okay it, i think it's a good thing to go in there with some some intrepidation or whatever if you went in thinking you knew everything about everything and you were really confident and i'm not sure that that's a good thing when you're starting off no definitely not because it's not true yeah and we learn I'm, not sure it's true. I'm not sure it's true after 34 years, but it certainly isn't true when you first start. Yeah. So I don't know what we're going to do next time, Bob. I think, uh, well, you asked me to, you know, send on several topics and I will. And there are so many. So uh, I'll send you some topics in the next three or four days so we can. Um, so we'll, 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 we'll leave it as a surprise for the next one. It'll be a surprise for all of us when we do the next one. <laughs> <laughs> Until then, speak to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.